This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. What is the difference between mere life and the good life? Aristotle once said, the good life is a life informed by the principles that express our highest ideals, life as we would like to live it. The good life is an education that rattles and decenters. Relationships, sustenance, and aspiration. A life of reflection and agency in concert with others in pursuit of collective well-being. The good life is to equate instead with a healthier public life. Pursuing knowledge, cultivating friendship, preserving freedom, satisfying needs. The good life is having a language to express your deeper thoughts, emotion, and belief. The good life is when students' eyes light up at the realization that their engineering work will improve other people's lives. Stay with us as some of UC San Diego's finest scholars share their pursuit of the good life. Tonight we'd like to talk to you about the idea of happiness. So the talk is called The Urbanization of Happiness and the decline of civic imagination. We'd like to talk about how the idea of happiness has evolved through time, particularly in the Western philosophical tradition, and how this evolution has worked its way into public culture, into political economy, and ultimately how it's manifested concretely in urban space. We will especially focus on the San Diego-Tijuana border region um, as a sort of cross-border territory of urban contrasts, which really serves as the laboratory for so much of our work uh, right now. So what I'd like to do is to begin with the question of, of freedom and, uh, and, and happiness as they emerged in ancient thought. So, we begin with Aristotle, 4th century BC Athenian philosopher, student of Plato, who wrote a lot about politics, about ethics, and had a lot to say about the idea of, of happiness. Now for Aristotle, to think about happiness, you have to think about three concepts together. We need to think about human nature. What is it that makes us human? which is very closely connected with what it is that makes us happy. So nature, physis, is connected to eudaimonia, happiness. And then freedom is very closely associated with capacities to fulfill our happiness. So these ideas are very closely connected. Human nature, human happiness, and human freedom. Now, how did Aristotle define these things? Well, let's start with his view of nature. What we are as human beings, Aristotle argued that we are fundamentally political creatures. And he used the concept zoon, politicon, a political animal. And what he essentially meant by this is that we are naturally inclined to participate with our fellows for the well-being of all. And it was a challenge to the idea that, that human beings are fundamentally rational, that human beings are fundamentally acquisitive. For Aristotle, human beings are fundamentally connected with one another and social creatures. And this is fundamental then to his idea of happiness. So for Aristotle, happiness is connected to nature in this way. Happiness consists in civic participation. This is where we most fulfill our nature in collaboration with our peers conceived of by Aristotle as equals. Essentially, we might think of happiness as consisting for Aristotle in civic life, in the exercise of citizenship. So to take this then one step further, we have the idea of freedom. 
Freedom for Aristotle is an exercise concept. Essentially, it's our capacity, our ability to engage in civic life. Freedom understood this way is an enabling principle, an exercise concept that connects our nature through civic practice with our happiness as human beings. So we might think of freedom here conceived in Aristotelian terms as civic freedom. So this is how the logic works. Man is by nature a zoon politicon. We are social and political creatures. Thus, since happiness is the manifestation of our nature, happiness consists then in civic participation, and freedom consists in our capacity to do so. That's how all of these concepts hang together. And of course, in ancient life, civic freedom always took place in a public space, in a polis, in concert with our fellows conceived of as citizens exercising their freedom on equal terms. Here is a photo of the Athenian Agora, the site of ancient Athenian democracy. Um, here we see a, a more schematic rendering of the Agora in central Athens. Um, we'll have a lot more to say about the spaces of civic freedom in a moment. Now, what I'd like to do is to contrast this ancient way of thinking about human nature, human happiness, and human freedom with the way these ideas evolved into the modern period. Now, of course, this is a very highly kind of binary and schematic way of thinking about ideas and history, um, starkly contrasting ancient with modern without addressing variations in each one of the traditions, alternative traditions, the contexts in which these ideas manifested. But in broad brush strokes, which is what I'd like to do here, I guess there are variations, <clears throat> what we witness in the modern period, it is a, a, a pretty substantial transformation uh, in the way nature, happiness, and freedom were conceived, the way they resonated in modern political and social culture, the way they resonated in economic life, and the way they ultimately manifested in space, in, in urban uh, space. So let's review these concepts now. We have human nature, human happiness, and human freedom. What happened to these concepts in the modern philosophical tradition? Well, fundamentally, this idea of human nature transformed from a social concept or a political concept into a fundamentally personal or individualist concept. So man is by nature homo economicus, rather than zoon politica, a, an economic creature. Now, the, the idea of homo economicus was actually created in the 19th century. But fundamentally, what it means is that we are, by nature, seekers of pleasure, avoiders of pain, and we possess a kind of calculating faculty that enables us to pursue one and reject the other. And all of our choices are sort of filtered through this calculating mechanism. Right? So we are, uh, by nature, maximizers of pleasure and minimizers of pain. And this manifests, well, and, well, and because of this, let me just say uh, as well, that because of this, all social and political behavior which the ancients might have understood as natural, right, is thus conceived as instrumental, so that we pursue political ends for the sake of our own private pleasure, our own private interests, and that we seek social behavior, uh, so, social relations for the same thing. Let me give you, uh, let me give you an example. So, 18th century classical political economist and philosopher Adam Smith spoke about the brewer, the butcher, and the baker. Now, the brewer, the butcher, and the baker are sociable right, toward their customers, not because they care about their customers in any intrinsic sort of way. It's not a social bond between the merchant and the customer. It's an instrumental calculation. right? If I want this customer to come back, I will behave in certain ways that's likelier to, you know, to generate ongoing business. This is essentially what I mean by the modern sort of instrumentality of social behavior. Of course, there are variations on this in modern thought, but this is just a fundamental sort of 
uh, baseline idea in much of the modern philosophical tradition. Okay, so we are by nature, you know, selfish creatures inclined to maximize our pleasure, reduce our pain. Happiness connected with this idea of nature thus consists in private pursuits, right? I achieve my happiness in the course of pursuing my pleasure. And I decide for myself what that pleasure is. It's going to vary from person to person. But nevertheless, happiness is understood as a private pursuit. Now, it's important to just contextualize this a little bit. What were the moderns fundamentally trying to do in many of these 17th and 18th century theories? Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, and so forth. The fundamental challenge was traditional forms of authority that stifled individual freedom that stifled the individual spirit. So it makes good sense that the moderns wanted to separate out a sphere of activity where individuals could pursue their own delectation, their own pleasures, without the encroachment of authorities, whether it's you know, the state or religious institutions, right, or just you know, feudal hierarchies, static hierarchies in society. There was an, uh, you know, uh, an urge to liberate the individual from these traditional forms of authority. So what the moderns did is they created a demarcation between what they called the public sphere, right, which engaged public matters, and the private sphere, and wanted to expand the private sphere where the individual would have as much latitude as possible to pursue his or her own ends. Okay, so this, there was a kind of rigidification of activities understood as public, and activities understood as private. Okay? It's almost spatialized into two spheres. Now, freedom thus consisted in absence of constraints within this private sphere, that I am able to do whatever I want within this sphere of activity without any constraint or encroachment from external authorities. And the goal of modern thinkers was to expand that sphere as much as possible, to give the, you know, the individual as much freedom as possible um, to pursue uh, one's own unique happiness. Now, what happened, though, in this transformation is that the absence of constraint right, became connected with public and civic life itself. So that civic participation, public participation, was seen as a kind of impediment on the freedom of individual choice. So these things were separated out. And we're going to see now how this manifested in economic relations, as well as in the construction of our built environment. So I'm going to turn things over to Teddy now um, on the manifestation of happiness in urban space. Thank you, Thora. Um, Definitely, as an architect, an urbanist have been very much interested in understanding the physical and spatial implications of many of these conceptions, obviously, of happiness and freedom. Um, and summarizing and maybe expanding or qualifying a bit more uh, these uh, thoughts that Fona just shared about this in the context of the ancient, ancients, obviously, happiness consisting in civic participation and freedom in our capacity to do so has direct uh, repercussions in the articulation of space. I mean, for us, obviously, the paradigmatic expression of this urbanistically is the Athenian Agora. In fact, uh, I love to read about this period because the dimension of the plaza itself was based on the voice of a citizen that could be heard on the other end of it. Uh, obviously, the marketplace was juxtaposed and so on. It's, there are very interesting conceptions of space here, obviously, we might not be able to reproduce this uh, any longer. Uh, for more, some of the ancient philosophers, uh, the, uh, the size of the city in order to enable that participation needed to be 5,000 people. I mean, what do we do when actually we've grown uh, uh, in, in such ways today? But obviously, the ancient uh, city, but also the historic city as we know it, uh, ha was articulated, uh, obviously, by the commons as the main armature to organize the urban fabric. And on the other end, I, I imagine if we were to quickly uh, imagine an example of how this more modern uh, idea of this conception consisting, in fact, on private pursuits and freedom, in my mind as an urbanist thinking of it, in the absence of constraint, the right to be left alone 
obviously has implications in the construction of the environment itself in the way that we've seen the irresponsible sprawl that determines and characterizes every city in the world today, atomizing the territory in this archipelago of enclaves that do not relate to each other, and in fact lack uh, a public infrastructure uh, to produce uh, the connectivity and the civic participation we are talking about. Happiness consisting also on an economic power might suggest that uh, the absence of constraint on accumulation depends somehow on, on the lack of uh, social responsibility. And this obviously is at the basis of recent political economies of the growth of the city in the last years uh, of the huge explosion of urbanization everywhere in the world. In fact, I've been meditating about this uh, very much in the last uh, years when I've realized finally that the huge explosion of urbanization supported uh, by an economic boom of uh, recent decades also produced in tandem a dramatic marginalization. The explosion of slums in many cities, in many global cities in the world, this uh, socioeconomic inequality, this urban asymmetry is what really defines uh, the world today and is at the center of today's urban crisis. But many times I think that the urban crisis today is not only environmental or economic, but it's primarily a cultural crisis. I would like to forward it as such. And by that I mean the inability, the incapacity of our institutions to reimagine the stupid ways by which we have been growing in the last decades. Obviously, a good life uh, in, in recent time has been framed by an individualist and private paradigm, physicalized in the oil-hungry suburban sprawl that has finally, in, our, in front of our very eyes, become, has become unsustainable. And so, while I understand this to be the fundamental problem today, many times I meditate that the real problem is the way we think as institutions we are solving the problem by simply camouflaging uh, these uh, uh, socioeconomic uh, injustices without really questioning the political economy of urban growth today, I think it's very difficult to advance the conversation as this has been the center again of the production of the city in recent decades as the epicenter of consumption. Urbanizations of consumption from Southern California to New York to Dubai. And as an architect, uh, I'm can share with you that I sometimes get in trouble because I've been trying to speculate, is this the future? The future in my mind, I tend to say to my colleagues, depends today less on buildings and more in fact in the reorganization of socioeconomic relations. And obviously for this is uh, uh, fundamental to imagine that at the center of those socioeconomic relations is confronting head on the question of inequality today in the city. So obviously this is a time when all of us would agree, I hope, uh, that the crisis has been defined by the moving of resources from the many to the very few. Recently I saw a strange statistic that in the recent World um, Economic Forum in Davos, 80 people present in that forum had the same economic resources as 3 billion people in the world. This huge disparity is at the center again of uh, American inequality today. I would like to dwell on this for a moment uh, by sharing with you the work of uh, French economists Emmanuel Saez and Thomas Piketty, who are professors in Berkeley. And recently they produced a beautiful study uh, of American inequality by confronting two lines. As an artist, I sometimes like to visualize uh, crisis and to make some of these statistical graphs accessible to the public to be more provocative. These two lines that for them move across time expanding, stretching, and compressing across time, uh, mainly from the late uh, 20s to the uh, mid-2000s. You can see two peaks, one to the left, one to the right, and in the middle of the valley. The bottom line also rep reproduces and mirrors this peak and valley in the, in the middle. Uh, obviously, uh, what we are suggesting here that, as any politician would say in our time, our own economic downturn is very similar to the Great Depression because at those two moments in the history of this country, we find the largest income inequality. It's unavoidable. We all agree that that is the case. 
What is interesting and provocative about their study is that the line beneath rep reproducing those same uh, peak and valleys uh, represent the lowest taxation on the wealthy at those very two moments. In my mind, this visualizes the hypocrisy of trickle-down economics on one hand, and on the other renders clear that at this moment when income, social economic inequality occurs, we also find a direct proportion in the unaccountability of institutions. But while everybody would agree on those two moments, it seems to me that nobody is talking about the valley. What happened after the Great Depression? Uh, in fact, uh, I have been trying to understand this from the context of political theory and, and, and the transformation of institutional thinking during that time. Already by the late 20s, FDR presents us with a new deal. The synergizing of institutions across philip, uh, uh, civic philanthropy, government and communities to enable a Bill of Rights that presents us with amazing investment, in fact, in, in, in public infrastructure. The WPA program emerges, Works Progress Administration, that means uh, inf uh, investment in public infrastructure, public housing, public parks, public health, in fact, public was not a forbidden word in our political language during this period. Obviously, I'm grossly generalizing because there were many problems also as part of this period. But nevertheless, this period was fundamentally defined by a public imagination. So the peaks might pertain to a kind of private paradigm, and that valley would reflect a public paradigm. So in a time uh, when the public has been somehow camouflaged through privatization, it's fundamental that we question or we open the provocation, where is the public today? I don't think FDR can come back anytime soon. Where do we find it? In my mind as an immigrant in this country, I never forget uh, one of the most amazing moments that has been embedded in our consciousness, I think, as a society in this country. The moment when Rosa Parks sat in the seat where she did not belong. One can argue that that bus was public but in fact it was not accessible to everyone. So I would like to suggest again as a way of uh, uh, engaging decisions, issues, we need to move urgently from the abstraction of our conception of the public today to the reality of unequal access, to rethink the public today. The question is then, where is our civic imagination? Fona? So, one place we might look to cultivate a new civic imagination is to the ancient tradition of civic freedom that I discussed earlier, uh, to rethink the cultivation of public life and the equitable distribution of public goods through that rubric. But let's think for a minute about ancient democracy and how it actually worked. You might start linguistically. So democracy, breaking it down. Demos, right, the people, plus kratos is power. So the power of the people. But who exactly was the demos in ancient democratic life? Well, the demos was comprised of male citizens, descended from citizens who had completed military service, which of course excluded foreigners, excluded women, of course, children, slaves, was a slaveholding society, and others incapable, Aristotle said, of excellence, which included certain classes of laborers and so on. So in fourth century BC Athens, which was a huge city compared to most of the thousand of other city-states in, in, in Greece, of a population of 250 to 300,000, there were only 30,000 voting citizens, right? So 10% of the population uh, were actually uh, comprising uh, uh, the demos. So, you know, the, the goal then, the goal then is to take what was valuable about the ancient civic tradition, um, but to adapt it to modern realities that we are no longer willing to live without or we cannot live without. So. The goal is to create a new civic imagination, learning from the ancient civic tradition, suited to new socio-cultural realities. The first one, fundamental equality. We don't tolerate the kinds of inequality that were fundamental in ancient Greek life. 
we just we're, we live in a different, a different era now. The goal is more inclusivity. So a new civic imagination that takes into account um, uh, the demands of equality. Individuality. You know, we value individualism as moderns. This is not going anywhere. The question is how to make individuality compatible with a new ethics of social responsibility in public thinking. Privatization. Privatization is not receding. Again, the question is how privatization can be made compatible with public investment. And one of the projects Teddy and I are working on right now with the city is to figure out how to pull together interesting public-private partnerships in investing in the quality of urban life uh, in our region. Scale. Obviously, we don't live in a small Greek city-state anymore. So we, we don't want to return, obviously, to the Athenian agora as a model of contemporary egalitarian democracy. We need to be thinking on different, different scales, uh, which includes, of course, representation. Athenian democracy was a direct, uh, a direct participation where people were not represented by others, but actually voiced their own will in the polis. That really is no longer possible unless we're talking about very small scale local um, civic arrangements. And finally, globalization and interconnectedness. Um, we're connected to others now in a way that obviously the Greeks were not through communication, through flows like trade, disease, the environment, uh, and so forth. Democracy can no longer be seen as an insular activity that takes place within narrow territorial uh, boundaries, right? So we need to adapt civic imagination to these new contemporary realities. And we also need to think about how our legacy of negative freedom you know, the absence of constraint, freedom understood as an absence of constraint on our will, and the resulting, you know, privatization can be made compatible with an ethics of social responsibility to others. That the wealth and high standard of living enabled by modern freedom carries with it inescapable responsibilities toward the well-being of others, both near and far, on whose backs global wealth too often rests. And one thing that's really interesting you know, to, to, to discover is that this idea of social responsibility is not foreign to the modern liberal tradition. You know, if you look, for example, at John Locke, the 17th century British political philosopher who wrote, among other things, a powerful defense of individual property and limited government in the wake of the English Civil Wars and was so influential on the American founding in their formulation of our rights to life, liberty, and happiness, he wrote this. So, being all equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. This is very familiar language, even to a contemporary ear. But look what else Locke says about our responsibilities. When his own preservation comes not in competition, the individual, ought he as much as he can to preserve the rest of mankind. There is an ethical imperative here of the duty of the individual toward his fellows. You see this again in Adam Smith, who I've written a lot about, the father of free markets. He understood the ethical constraints on economic activity. Um, he wrote an entire book about ethics uh, that not too many people read. Um, he was a vicious critic of greed. He was a vicious critic of the conditions of the working poor in early industrial capitalism. And in the very Bible of free markets, the Wealth of Nations, which he wrote in 1776. He devoted an entire section of that book, indeed the lengthiest section of the Wealth of Nations, to a discussion of the state's provision of public goods and to the importance of a vibrant public culture, although he used different language to describe it, and with citizens who are civically engaged with one another. He was worried about the political apathy that modern economic society was bringing about. He wanted uh, a citizenry that was aware enough of political reality 
to be able to constrain the vices and corruption of politicians. Now, these are, these are dimensions of classical economic thought from the pen of the master uh, himself, the primacy of the ethical, the limits on accumulation, the degradations of the laboring poor, the importance of public goods and public space and public education and public health. He talked about all of these things. The necessity of a vibrant public culture and an engaged citizenry. All of these ideas have lost currency in the last two centuries as capitalism became unmoored, I would argue, from its classical ethical roots. Obviously, capitalism is not going anywhere soon, nor might we want it to go anywhere. The key, I believe, is to resist the steady erosion of civic life, the steady erosion of public space and public thinking that has accompanied the triumph of privatization and free market thinking. And the conceptions, I guess, of citizenship that emerge from this, uh, as an architect, obviously, I want to link citizenship with the spatialization of the territory. In fact, many times I would like to link conceptions of citizenship with the kind of visual cognition of the territory itself. It's interesting to imagine that in the context of San Diego, Tijuana, both cities have the same population, and yet San Diego has grown six times larger than Tijuana, immediately confronting one of the most pressing issues in today's global discussion about the future of cities, the struggles, the kind of tensions between the sprawl and density. I'm beginning now to enter into our own locality and, and in terms of our own region as a laboratory, which for Fona and I have been essential in advancing our scholarship, our research, and our practice, uh, enabling us to enter into the specificity, as I was uh, mentioning earlier, from the abstraction of the global to the reality of the political economies of division that uh, characterize this environment. In fact, obviously, conflict, global conflict, when it hits the ground, is physicalized. And in our region, it's obviously physicalized in this border wall that transforms San Diego into the world's largest gated community. For that, I am referring to the fact that this wall itself becomes the emblematic artifact of backward planning policies that have depended on an urbanization of fear that has, again, atomized and divided our territories, communities, and jurisdictions. At no other place in the world, I think, we can find some of the wealthiest real estate, as the one found in Rancho Santa Fe, barely 30 minutes away from some of the poorest settlements in Latin America, as the one found in the edges of Tijuana. This radical proximity of wealth and, uh, and, uh, and poverty is what characterizes every city, I think, in the world today. So our research has been really trying to learn from what I call the social practices of adaptation that tend to transcend and transgress the imposition of political and economic recipes. I'm talking about the marginalized communities and neighborhoods flanking the border on both sides of San Diego, Tijuana, because it is there where we can begin to find probably other ways of constructing the city. In fact, other definitions of the public, why not to say it, and civic participation, other ways of constructing citizenship. As an urbanist, I'm interested in the notion of citizenship that ceases less as uh, having the documents that make you belong to the nation state, but in fact, upholding it as a creative act that reorganizes institutions and protocols in the spaces themselves of the city. As an artist, I've been, in fact, uh, visualizing the processes of adaptation of many stories by immigrants and teenagers as they begin to transform spaces that are underutilized in the city. One of these stories uh, that I always like to share is a story that begins with this simple map. What would happen if we were to erase the city and we would only leave the, the uh, empty spaces, the kind of archipelago of voids uh, that are really part of this uh, urbanization of um, suburbanization? Places like the collision of freeways and neighborhoods, for example. So one story that I began to document years ago pertains to a series of teenagers, a group of teenagers, tired of not really having a skateboard park uh, you know, for themselves. They decided one night to organize themselves, to go to Home Depot with, and to buy shovels, and come together as a group 
and invaded this space under the freeway uh, at Washington Street and Freeway 5 near Mission Hills. Um, two weeks later, after they began to dig their mounds to produce their skateboard, skateboard park, the police stopped them. Uh, they evicted them, they barricaded the place, and the teenagers decided to fight back. The first thing that they did, the teenagers told me as I interviewed them in, in the documentary that we shaped out of this story, is something that none of my colleagues has ever told me, whether artists, architects, or politicians, that the first thing that they did was to find out where they had begun to dig, to understand the specificity of political jurisdiction in that neutral space that was not used by anyone. They were lucky, they said to me, because they had not begun digging under Caltrans territory, which is the, <laughs> state, the state agency that governs the freeway, would have been very difficult to negotiate with them. They had begun digging in an arm of the freeway that belonged to the local municipality, making it easier for them to negotiate. They were also lucky, they said, because they had begun to dig in a sort of Bermuda Triangle of jurisdiction between Port Authority, Aeroport Authority, two city districts, and a review board corridor. Now, all of these red lines are obviously represent the political institutions that govern that space administratively, but are invisible. The teenagers decided then to go and look uh, for the political actors behind these institutions as skaters. They organized themse themselves even deeper. They contacted city officials. They negotiated with the city attorney, who told them in return that in order to continue negotiations, they had to become an NGO. As an NGO, they didn't know what it was. They had to contact uh, friends in Seattle who had gone through a similar experience. This exchange of knowledge across activist practices uh, and, and um, sort of community agency, let's say, is essential. They began to realize that they needed to gain the knowledge of the political inscribed in the economic inscribed in the territory. They had to be familiarized with every single permit in the code. In fact, began to open up and critique the definition of open public space in this city, which is hugely abstract. It's just green space. They wanted to create other categories of open space and land use. The story is too long to share with you here today, but it suffices to say that at the end they won the case, and out of a transference of liability from the public to the semi-private, they were able, in fact, to gain management and, and, and control of that space for one, one cent a year, and they ended up uh, building their own skateboard park. Many times when I share this story, obviously it sounds maybe trivial to many, but for me as an architect, it became an essential example of how conflict can be a creative tool, that many of us need to, in fact, begin to expose the processes, political and economic, that are embedded and are invisible sometimes in the spaces of the city. That what brought this uh, group together to become a community was really a, an, a condition of urgency that shaped the practice of operation. In other words, we also tend to loosely throw uh, notions such as community around, but for me it has been essential to understand that community really is embedded in practices that summons people together in order to produce a kind of course of action. And finally, they were able to negotiate the top down with the bottom up. In my work, many times I'm criticized that I just maybe look at the small uh, and the informal, the bottom up, but these teenagers showed that they were, they encroached into this space informally but the, their, their task was to begin trickling up to transform top-down policy. More and more we need, I think, that negotiation between the top-down and bottom-up. And finally, the teenagers actually were able to design not only the physical space, but in fact the protocols that would assure sustainability and accessibility into that environment. So we cannot separate the physical from the socio-political. Uh, another example that for me is essential in understanding a region is not only these invisible acts of transformation by immigrants and teenagers in this case, but to understand the relationship between Tijuana and San Diego in the shape of a series of transborder informal uh, urban flows. I'm referring to the fact that on one hand we have, we have immigrants traveling northbound, transforming American neighborhoods. Much of my research in fact dwells on the question of the impact of immigration in the transformation of the American neighborhood today. But on the other, we find the flow of waste from San Diego into Tijuana. I've been documenting in the last years how small bungalows from the post-war years, from those first ring of suburbanizations, the kind of levy towns of Southern California, uh, as developers in San Diego are demolishing those small houses to construct a more inflated version uh, of those subdivisions, these small houses are given to Mexican speculators. So these are houses waiting to cross the border. <laughs> 
not only people cross the border, but entire pieces of infrastructure moved from one city to the next. And once these houses are in Tijuana, they are placed on top of these moment frames, these steel frames, leaving the first floor open-ended to become a second, uh, to be infilled with more house, maybe small business. This, is, this very strange and surreal layering of programs is what defines density in Tijuana. I call this a kind of club sandwich of urbanization, this sort of fearless approximation of opposites. Entire houses recycled into Tijuana, but also rubber tires. I'm sure you've seen many of these examples in the past where people use rubber tires to construct retaining walls. But look at what people in conditions of socioeconomic emergency have been able to do. They have figured out a system to peel off the tire, to fold it, uh, and clip it and juxtapose it to produce a more functional retaining wall. Again, in conditions of socioeconomic emergency, creativity flourishes. Now I want to be careful here because I don't want to romanticize poverty. All I'm trying to say is that as an architect, I've always been inspired by the creative intelligence embedded in community agency in this case. The garage doors from Riverside and Southern California, which are exported, or as you say, imported into Tijuana to construct emergency housing in those uh, shanty towns, is incredible to witness. So these are houses made with the garage doors from these older subdivisions that have become obsolete in San Diego. So this bricolage of recycling and opportunities that are opened up in these shanty towns, uh, as an artist, present us with a challenge that we need to confront images and processes. We cannot only look at these images as being seductive, let's say, of being sort of uh, romantically understood as a bricolage of urbanization. We need to understand what are the social, political, and economic procedures behind them. I've been many times uh, interested in suggesting mm -hmm. that bottom-up urbanization is, needs to be conceived as a praxis. I'm interested as a researcher at UCSD, along with Fona, trying to understand the actual procedures behind these conditions so that we can begin to challenge or begin to move away from urbanizations of consumption to neighborhoods of production. Uh, which in fact are really what is what define these, these environments. Finally, uh, while uh, our interest is in understanding the power, the nature of informal urbanization as expressed in these slums, trying to understand again the socioeconomic procedures from which we can learn and translate to reimagine urban policy, Tijuana is also growing in the same way as San Diego. This is in fact the edges of Tijuana. As private developers now taking advantage of public subsidies are building are replicas of San Diego's suburbanization, but in miniature. These are track homes that invade and encroach into the edges of the city, replicating the, the track homes of our subdivisions in San Diego, but in miniature. Uh, this is strange kind of environment. This is a house that is 250 square feet for a family, but has a mini front yard, a mini backyard, and a mini setback. Again, the reproduction uh, of one model into the other city. But while these beige, small, mini-me's are being built seemingly to satisfy the desire of Tijuanans to be like San Diego, people have begun to prove that this is, do is not lasting that long. So somebody already built a small shop in the front yard, or maybe somebody's adding a second floor. All of a sudden, this environment is beginning to fundamentally transform again into a series uh, of temporal uh, socioeconomic dynamics. It is this possibility of flexibility, agility, and transformability, let's see, of the environment that uh, must be essential in trying to understand other conceptions of public space. I couldn't avoid uh, uh, showing you this uh, actual video to, to really get to the point of what I'm trying to suggest. It's in Bangkok. Uh, obviously, you see a train moving by. I'm not suggesting that we should live in close proximity to the train. But nevertheless, once the train uh, passes, uh, the market that used to be there before the train would go through begins to reassemble itself <laughs> in, in a matter of seconds. Can spaces, in fact, transform in such a way? Can we learn from this creative intelligence to reimagine public infrastructure? Because what is fundamental to this informal dynamics is that in these shanty towns or in these slums or in these environments, they are defined by the negotiation of time boundary, space, and resources uh, simultaneously. It is from here from which we can maybe begin to conceive a different political language that can enable us to redefine density today. Density less conceived, as we have abstractly 
understood it as simply an amount of objects per area, an amount of buildings per area. Many of these uh, um, environments in these marginalized neighborhoods, density is conceived differently as an amount of socio-economic exchanges per area. This is a very different conception of density that might be essential to reimagine zoning today in the city, less conceived as a punitive tool, and in fact, elevating zoning as a generative tool that can enable us to organize activity and economy today. Only then we can begin to open up other forms of democratization of urban development, recalibrating the role of individuals collectives and institutions in co-producing the city. So now Fona will continue uh, with opening up a fundamental part of our work. How do we intervene as scholars in the interface between institutions and communities, suggesting the curating of cross-sector uh, cross collaboration? So one of the projects that we've been most excited about um, in the last couple of years is funding that we have received here at UCSD from the Blum Center for Developing Economies, which is an entity at Berkeley focused on global poverty. So here at UC San Diego, our funding from Blum is now called the Blum Cross-Border Initiative. And essentially what we've been trying to do is to localize what is generally understood as a global phenomenon. So what the Blum Center at Berkeley does is it sends students, undergraduate students across the world to study you know, economic and political development in the proper global south. So kids spend time in Africa, South Asia, and so on. The Blum folks were extremely excited that because of our location, UC San Diego could uh, train students in global poverty studies right here in our own neighborhood. So what we've done is we've convened a consortium of entities here on the UCSD campus who are collaborating in the new Blum Cross-Border Initiative to put students in close proximity with the kind of bottom-up community-based intelligence that Teddy was just talking about. So the Center on Global Justice, which is the entity in the social sciences, which I direct, the Division of Global Public Health, so social science, collaborating with medicine, collaborating with the Center for Urban Ecologies, with it, which is architecture and urbanism, uh, uh, collaborating with the Urban Studies and Planning Program, and Cal IT2, which is focused on technology and the use of technology in um, undergraduate education in these communities. So what you see here is a reinvestment of UC San Diego in its own neighborhood. Students and academics engaging community-based organizations for the purpose of, of, of um, you know, intelligent uh, community engagement. Um, one of the projects that we're developing is the UCSD Community Stations, which is essentially a collaboration between faculty, students, and community-based organizations. We're developing stations in the field where students are actually doing uh, research uh, and, and training uh, here in the region. So it's, you know, the, the, the campus speaks a lot about its public mission, about community engagement, and this new Blum project is enabling that kind of um, enabling uh, that kind of investment and scaling up many projects that have already existed. Another really interesting project in cross-sector collaboration is what Teddy and I conceived of um, in the city of San Diego under the previous mayor, um, which survived after he left office and Todd Gloria picked up on it. It's now an entity called the Civic Innovation Lab um, which Teddy and I now serve as advisors for. And essentially, it is a collaboration of universities with community-based organizations, which of course is a connection that we're already developing here on the campus, the connection between universities and communities, but now bringing the municipality into the mix. And so the municipality obviously has capacity to scale up projects that university community partnerships alone don't have. 
And so we have this sort of triangulation of entities collaborating um, on neighborhood initiatives and uh, on cross-border initiatives. Um, we're not only working with the city of San Diego, but also with the city of Tijuana. And we're negotiating interesting new models of cross border municipal collaboration on urban planning and policy, which is really unprecedented um, in our region. And one thing that we are particularly excited about is that the Civic Innovation Lab has just received funding from the Ford Foundation to conduct what we are referring to as the Binational Citizenship Culture Survey. So in the background here, you see the image of a fellow by the name of Antanas Mokus. And he was the mayor of Bogota, Colombia, uh, primarily in the 90s. Bogota was one of the most dangerous cities on the planet. And Antanas was a very courageous uh, mayor. Uh, he was trained, actually, as a philosopher and, and an economist. And what he did is he turned the mayor's office into a virtual think tank where sectors, the, the private sector, you know, community-based organizations, civic philanthropy, universities and, and the municipality worked collaboratively to define the city's problems and to create cross-sector collaborative solutions to those problems. They created amazing interventions in the city. Um, and within 10 years, the city really turned itself around on all public health indexes and so forth. So Bogota is, a, is, a, is an example of, of, a, of a truly successful uh, 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 progressive urban transformation. When Antanas left office, he set up a, a, an NGO in Bogota called Corpo Visionarios. And what they do is they assist municipalities across the world to work on creative solutions to deeply entrenched social and, and cultural problems. And they do this through a kind of very sophisticated piece of social science called the Citizenship Culture Survey. They come to municipality with the city. They enumerate this survey. They learn about the, about the context. And they work with the city to develop interventions. Well, we've gotten funding from the Ford Foundation to bring Corpo Visionarius here to San Diego to do a citizenship culture survey on this side of the border, but also to do one on the other side of the border. And the survey is going to help us understand how these municipalities can collaborate together in cross-border municipal collaborative projects. And we've got both mayor's offices on both sides of the border signed on to it. And the survey is being uh, created right now and will be uh, applied uh, in the next few months. So, the attempt here in San Diego now is to rethink the way you know, creative urbanization happens with the participation of the kind of bottom-up creativity and cross-sector collaboration between public and private that we've been talking about in this lecture. So this is the last segment now to uh, finish uh, with the topic of the re-emergence re of civic freedom in space. As Fon already pointed out, some of uh, our most sort of most important references come from Latin America. In fact, uh, while the attention of the world has been in the Arab Emirates or China in terms of the explosion of urbanization, it was in Latin America in the last couple of decades where some of the most progressive urban transformations took place, precisely as governments, in a kind of top-down way for a moment, really reached out to the bottom up to collaboratively reimagine, again, what uh, civic freedom uh, means and its physical implications in the city. So they really tapped into social networks and informal economies and new modes of civic participation, beginning uh, with a, a Porto Alegre in Brazil, uh, where the mayor in the late 70s, early 80s produced what is called participatory budgets, enabling communities to have a say in the redistribution of municipal uh, budgets uh, in, that, in those communities. So this uh, idea of opening up uh, uh, the participation of neighborhoods in reshaping their own infrastructure. Uh, to Antanas Mokus, the again legendary mayor uh, that Fona mentioned, a philosopher turned mayor in the city of Bogota, uh, who in fact became legendary because of his way of in, uh, producing new models of community participation, 
would be uh, great just to tell many stories about this mayor. In fact, one of the most uh, uh, surreal moments in his mayorship is when he replaced 500 traffic police with mimes uh, to engage uh, fatalities in downtown Bogota. But the whole idea of uh, suggesting that no physical transformations in the city can occur without first building public trust and civic participation intervening in the social norms and the behavior of the populace uh, to uh, the fact that these projects of civic participation in Bogota paved the way for one of the most creative uh, uh, public transportation systems in the world, the Transmillennium project that Enrique Peñalosa, the mayor after Antanas Mocos produced, basically doing the opposite of what we would do in the, in here in San Diego in terms of fixing traffic problems. Here we would add two lanes to the freeway. They subtracted their two lanes in order to then insert uh, a bus system that acts like a metro. They elevated the sidewalks and uh, retrofitted the buses so that people would enter uninterrupted uh, to expedite uh, time and so on. The retrofitting of existing spaces in the city to produce more efficient uh, public transportation systems. One of the most progressive uh, uh, systems of mobility in Bogota, so it's not only buses acting like metros, but places where people leave their bicycles, uh, uh, they produce infrastructure to support pedestrian and bicycle activity, the largest infrastructure in the world really uh, supporting that. Uh, retrofitting slums with new systems of transportation and mobility. The example of Medellin is fundamental, how uh, civic philanthropy, government, community and universities synergized to invest in unprecedented ways in one of in some of the most marginalized poor areas of the city in the slums in order to fight not only violence in this city uh, but socioeconomic inequity so they link the metro I, uh, with the shanty towns by constructing these gondolas uh, and intervening inside the most precarious zones of the city with this amazing high quality infrastructure of transportation and to redefine also public space. This building that you see here uh, is what is called in Medellin uh, library parks. They conceive, completely reconceive the idea of public space there that is not only a space of beautification where people will appear magically one day, but instead they said in order to assure accessibility, we're going to inject knowledge into public space. So all the public spaces in Medellin have programming that is co-curated and collaboratively shaped across institutions. Knowledge and public space are synergized. Uh, and also the informal economies that are supported and incentivized in these environments begin to produce incredible transformations. Library parks, schools, universities, museums in the most marginalized zones of the city. The project, in essence, because it's uh, too much to again share here, depended on the summoning of all fragmented knowledges, policies, budgets, consolidating them in, in order to integrate a vision towards the city, but only to be redistributed into the most marginalized communities. So this project of simultaneous centralization and consolidation, but also redistribution to touch the most needed environments uh, in the city fundamentally began to change the relationship between urban policy and public imagination uh, in this city, which is really at the core of the message we wanted to share with you today. In essence, good life should really be equating a lot more with the healthier public life supported by a more sustainable and inclusive infrastructure. We could learn from Latin America. Thank you very much.